Michael Gomez, and I'm a real estate broker and an investor here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm Seth Mosley, Grammy award-winning songwriter and real estate investor. We host a monthly meetup in Middle Tennessee for anyone who wants to build passive income, not only for retirement, but for today. On the first Wednesday of every month, we bring in an expert from every area of investing to help you with things like finding deals, getting your financing locked in, asset protection, every kind of investing, so much more. Our videos are all about delivering that content to you. Go to musicandmoneyig.com for more info on our free monthly events. Hit subscribe on the page so you don't miss any awesome content and hit that like button if you like it. Don't let all the fur on my jacket distract you. Here's the content. So what is wholesaling? So um, wholesaling, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. I think you'll, you'll get a little bit different take from me on what it is, but this is what I think it is. I think it's a pawn shop. So I basically run a real estate pawn shop, if you could use that. So I, people think, uh, uh, real estate agents, uh, other house flippers that haven't worked with wholesalers, or at least a wholesaler that knows what they're doing, um, the people that come to us, they know that they need, they need the money, right? So if you guys look at pawn shops, do you, they, when they walk into that store, they know that they're not being ripped off. They know that they're making an offer on an item that you have, and they're going to turn around, and they're going to sell that item for more money. They know what they're getting when they come in. When we talk to the sellers, we go direct to sellers. So we're a marketing and sales company. We go to the seller. We tell them about what we do. We offer them a service. It's an option for them. They might want to sell it on the MLS. They might want to fix it up and rent it out themselves, but we give them an option and our price. And we talk to them about the, what we can do for them. And then what we do is we take our contract, and it's an assignable purchase agreement, and then we turn around and market our contract. We might buy it. We buy a lot of the houses that we put under contract. Uh, but a typical wholesaler, and that's all that they do, they're marketing that contract for sale. So we have to get it cheaper than a flipper. We have to get it cheaper than a landlord. We have to use our negotiation skills and our marketing to find that distressed seller that needs to pay, that needs to trade equity for ease of transaction. And that's what we do. So we're giving them the option to work with us, and then we can sell their contract to our network of people for a profit. But we're doing all the work, and we're tying it up in a little bow. So just like a pawn shop. I mean, they walk in the pawn shop. They know they're not going to get retail for their product, right? They're going to get less than retail. And they know that with us, too. And we tell them. And we say, look, this is what we're going to do. Here are your options. You can sell it with an agent. They know that. So if you think of it like that from the start, then we'll kind of go through what we do. So marketing and sales. This is the backbone of what we do. So we're not a real estate company. At least my company isn't. We, ha we happen to operate in real estate, but it could be boats or airplanes or anything. You name it. Watches. So um, with good marketing and sales, I think this is the backbone of really any business. Um, but as a wholesaler, this is it. If we can, market, if we can master marketing and we can master sales, then we're going to do, do well in our industry. Okay, lead generation. So this is kind of my breakdown of the cycle of a deal. Um, so marketing, sales, and, and together marketing and sales. <laughs> so lead generation, this is step one, right? So this is marketing. So without, it's, it, it, if you think of it kind of also like a funnel, what we do, um, it's really in any business, you've got this sales funnel. So in sales, a lot of people talk about lead generation, lead conversion, and then uh, fulfillment. Or client fulfillment, you might hear something like that. I think of it like uh, maximizing our profit or you know, realizing the profit on our, on our deal. Man, this is a... Okay, so lead generation we'll go into first. So that's marketing. Lead conversion, that's all about sales. So that's us going out on the appointment. And you don't have to run a wholesaling company to do these things. I mean, this, as a house flipper, as a, a general construction a builder, as a, you know, uh, even really anybody, hard money lending. So you've got to market for leads. Uh, you've got to convert the lead, right? And then you've got to realize your profit. So it, this is the, a cycle for everyone. So... You don't necessarily have to run a, a wholesaling company to run through this cycle. So when you guys see my pictures, <laughs> target. So we've got to have this target market, right? So step one, you're, it, whether you're a flipper, you're a landlord, or you're a wholesaler, is identify your target market. So where is it going to be in our case? So what I do is I was living in Pensacola, so that was my first market. When, I, when we kind of did everything that we could do in Pensacola, I was looking for another market. And so I had to go out and look at all of the signs in these different markets 
to see where I, where I wanted to go. So I landed on Chattanooga. It looked a lot like Pensacola. There's a lot of people doing deals, so it's cash transactions. A lot of investors from Nashville were starting to do business over in Chattanooga because it was too expensive here. So I saw, and I see some growth there. It's in a corridor between Nashville and Atlanta. So there's a lot of things that I liked about it. And as a wholesaler, you gotta look for a transacting market. So you gotta have a market that's transacting in cash. So are there people buying and selling properties? Are there flippers, are there landlords? Who is your client? So our clients are you guys, flippers, landlords, uh, builders, anybody, Airbnb is a totally new market, right? So now some of our customers might be Airbnb people. They can pay a little bit more. So us knowing our customer, we can know where we need to go. I looked at Columbia. I didn't see a lot of cash transactions in Columbia, um, so I didn't go there. Uh, but it's close to me, and I was uh, a little bit selfish there. I looked at it, and I tried to analyze it. So it might change in the next five or ten years. Maybe we, we, somewhere we do want to go. But as a wholesaler, you've got to know these things and, and get the pulse of your market. Then, budget. You gotta come up with a budget. So now I've identified a market that I wanna go into. I gotta figure out how much money do I have. Do I have money or do I not have any money? The good thing about me was when I got started, I was able to take, take some money aside and put it towards marketing. So I had $5,000 a month for six months. For six months, so I put aside $30,000 to start my company. I knew that in six months, if my money ran out, I was done. I was just gonna go back to flying, making money, uh, with the Navy, my rental properties were making money. So this was kind of money that I could just throw away. So for you guys, you can come up with, what is it? Is it 500 bucks, is it 200 bucks, is it 1,000, is it 10,000, is it 100? So I, I'd recommend giving yourself at least six months of runway if you're gonna start marketing, and know that it's gonna take a few months to start seeing some traction. And for me, it took, I think I'll talk about it, but it took me like three or four months to do my first deal. So after three months, $15,000 has been flushed down the toilet, think about that, and I'm going, uh-oh, like, was this the right thing to do? Do, we, do I keep sending the mail? Do I keep marketing? Do I keep to my plan? And the answer was yes. So for you guys, you've got to come up with that plan ahead of time. Don't, fl don't spend all your money in the first month and say, it didn't work. Direct mail doesn't work. Bill's up there talking about this stuff. It doesn't work. So I hear that a lot. Um, but if you commit to a plan, stick to it. And then what you can do is start adding some budget onto that over time. So... Figure out your budget. And then it comes down to, do you have money or do you not have money? So it's okay. A lot of people say, you guys probably heard, okay, wholesaling is like the first place that people should get started. You don't need any money to do it. You can make a ton of money in it. It's really easy. Um, no problem. Uh, sort of. But there are some things that we can do if we don't have money. So if you have, don't have money, you got to have time. It, so if you have time and you don't have money and you have some determination, you can do some of these things. So I'm going to give you some lead sources, some ways to market if you don't have money. So the first one is networking. You're doing it right now. So in this room, start networking for deals. You can be talking about it all the time. I know some guys that just like wrap their car and drive it around, and that's their lead source. Or they have a business card that they like stick at gas stations or drop them or hand them to people or, or whatever. They might have like a $100 bill on it folded up. So all these different creative ideas on networking, you can find deals networking. Last year, I think we did three or four flips where we made a little over $100,000 just from networking with people. This year, I got a text message on a Saturday with a realtor who couldn't, um, she couldn't sell this house, or the deal fell through, and she sent me a text and said, uh, this woman's motivated, she just wants to sell, she has to go into surgery soon. I said, all right, I sent my project manager, he looked at it, he said, this is what we can pay, I said, this is what we can pay, and she said, I think she might take it, talk to her, and she took it, she, but she needed to close on Tuesday. So I got a text message on Saturday, and we closed on Tuesday, and she had a full price offer that was like $40,000 higher than what we offered. But she needed to close on Tuesday because she's having surgery on Wednesday. And she knew. I mean, this is just how it goes. And that's just networking. So this is a realtor that I knew. First time a realtor ever brought me a deal. But I've been networking with realtors for two years. Just talk to people about what you do. Constantly be talking about it. Cold calling and door knocking. So sounds scary, right? Who wants to door knock on people's doors? But here's some different kind of lists you can pull or places you can go. So probate mailers. So there's places that have inheritance lists, probates. You can, you can buy those. You can go down to the courthouse and get probates or inheritance. So you, there's public records. Um, you can go find those and just knock on the doors or find their phone number and call them. Use the white pages. Use the, there's a lot of different ways to get people's phone numbers too. So some that cost money, some that don't cost money. Um, boarded up houses. You can just go drive around and look for houses that look like they're vacant and board it up. Uh, tax, tax lates, there's evictions. So, 
anytime people are doing evictions, they're public records, so you can go find out. Those are tired landlords, right? They just evicted their tenant. They're probably sick of it. They're done with it. We buy a lot of houses from people that have uh, evicted their tenants recently, or they want us to do it. Um, arrests, I mean, those are public records, right? Who's been arrested that owns a property? I bet they might want some money. Sometimes I've had, I've had to fax a contract to a bail bondsman before on house we bought. I mean, I remember going, the sheriff showed up, and I was like, whoa, what's this all about? We're signing the contract. And she said, oh, it's no problem. They're looking for the guy who lives in the house with her. And I said, okay, are you sure? So the sheriffs came. So we signed the contract. I said, look, I, I, I want to make sure that you're doing this because you want to do this. So this is when I'm still going on the appointments. Have a conversation with them. Make sure that I'm happy, I'm comfortable, it's ethical. It's not. And then she said, no, no, this is what we want to do. We, need to, we want to go. And then, sure enough, the next day I had to fax, the, fax it to the bail bondsman. So arrests, these are motivated people, right? Um, notice the defaults. People are going into foreclosure, public records, you can find that stuff. Um, so all of these things. But if you don't have money, you're probably not spending the money to mail to them. Or maybe you can write a handwritten letter and mail it to them. Um, or, you know, find them or knock on the doors or knock on the neighbor's doors. A lot of times the neighbors know a lot. You know that person in your neighborhood that knows everything about everybody that lives there? That's who you want to talk to. So maybe just knock on and say, hey, I noticed the house next door is vacant or uh, boarded up. Um, do you know anything about it or do you know how to get in touch with that person that lives there? Uh, that's a great lead. Um, the other thing that, that, that I teach my people to do is drive around on trash day. So on trash day, the vacant houses don't usually have the trash cans out in front of the house. Um, so that's a one way to possibly tell if a house is vacant. So you see a house that doesn't have the trash cans out and maybe it looks beaten up or nobody lives there or it's boarded up or something like that, then it can tell you a lot about the property. But then you've got to do the work, right? You've got to find out who owns it. You've got you to go find them. You've got to track them down. So that's the time part and the no money. Driving for dollars, talked about this a little bit before, but um, you can just drive around neighborhoods. So our people drive around the neighborhood. They're, they're driving around all the time to go on appointments. So when you're driving down, just write down some addresses, mail them, find out a phone number, go look for them, uh, talk to the neighbors, like I said. Um, we used to just walk around neighborhoods with, with my son, and I would just try to talk to people and look for, look for houses that way. Almost like networking combined with uh, vacants and driving for dollars. So um, Signs. I put a question mark here. Signs are relatively cheap. Um, we, we have never done signs. I don't personally do them, but there's, there's a lot of people that do and people that I know that make a lot of money from signs. A lot of people call them bandit signs, so I'll just throw out, like, just check the local municipalities and the laws against them and things like that. Um, it's just a lot of hassle for us, so we try to avoid it. But we're in the have money section. If you guys are having the don't, money, don't have money section, you, there might be some things that you want to do. What we do is we put signs in all of our rehab properties now that have phone number. It's like another quality renovation by Blackjack Real Estate and has our phone number. So not only do we get other people in the neighborhood that might want to sell their house, but we also get people that might want to buy this house when we're finished renovating it that will call. So those are just good ways to, to drive leads. So we'll put those in, the, in all the yards now. Um, this, this is the big thing here. And yeah, now you can't see it. But uh, do what others are unwilling to do. So if you don't have money, you have to do that. So what, what I'm not willing to do, because I'm in the have money section now, is what you in the don't have money section have to do. So I'm not, I'm not going to drive around and knock on people's doors. Like, uh, I don't want to do it. I just don't like to do it. Um, so if, you, if you're in the don't have money section, this is the kind of stuff that you need to be doing. So here's the I have money section. I thought this picture was pretty cool, this little kid I found on the Internet. So yeah, all these are like unlicensed photos, so I hope, uh, I hope like nobody's going to get after me for it. But last night I was like, wow, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to pull up some funny pictures. So uh, this kid kind of shocked me. He's holding that shiny Hamilton. Um, all right, direct mail. So this is what we do a lot, uh, direct mail. So big, big, niche, uh, big lists. So I have like my universe list that we send. We send 65,000 pieces a month of, uh, of postcards and direct mail. And I'm going to show you my, my pieces in a second. But... Um, this is what we do. We pull a list of, uh, we buy lists. So I'll buy a list of, um, of people with, and I think I talk about my list strategy in the future exactly what it is, and I'll tell you what we mail now. Um, but we'll pull a list of homeowners in, with certain criteria and filter them down. Um, so I think that there's possibly some motivation there. Our response rate is about 1%. So of 65,000 people a month, uh, what is that? Six, that what do we get? Uh, 10%, uh, six, 650 calls a month. That's it. So it's pretty bad, right? <laughs> But, you know, we're, we're, we, do a lot of, we do a lot of business from direct mail. It's a big funnel, right? It just keeps getting smaller and smaller at the bottom. So when I was sending 1,000 pieces a month, I was getting no business. Um, I had to start sending five or 6,000 pieces a month before I started seeing some, some revenue come in, started to close some deals. 
Um, uh, those niche lists too, so all that stuff I talked about before, so probates, vacants, tax lates, defaults, all that stuff can be rolled into a big direct mail campaign too, uh, just a little bit smaller lists. Um, Google AdWords, uh, pay-per-click. So uh, some of you might be familiar with it, some of you might not. Um, when you Google something now and it says ad, 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 like the first three things are ads, those guys are paying to, for you to see their ad based on what you typed in the search results. So if you type in like we buy houses Chattanooga, hopefully my ad comes up first. Don't click on it, please. It cost me about $55. Um, but we pay per click. So those are people that are looking for us. So it costs a lot more money. It's a lot more expensive, but it's usually a much more targeted lead. So there's Bing ads. There's, I don't know, Yahoo probably has something. We don't do that. Um, but Google AdWords is one of our big, uh, uh, big things that bring in revenue. You just wish you could save more money in taxes every year. Michael, I wish every year that that was going to be the case. So how do I save money? Oh, my recommendation would be to find a CPA that's also great at everything real estate related, that understands real estate investment. Chris Picurio with Integrated Financial Group. He is an absolutely amazing CPA and it's official sponsor of the Nashville Investors Podcast. If you guys are real estate investors looking to save money on taxes and make sure that you're properly structured, I think you can speak from personal experience saying that our listeners should go to integratedfg.com and connect with Chris Picurio. Uh, Facebook. So we do some Facebook ads now. We're still kind of playing around with it. Um, some of you guys are probably better on Facebook than others, but um, you can do the same thing. You can kind of uh, create a list and target people on Facebook, um, and they can see your ad, and we have to pay for that too. That's a lot cheaper, but usually we get a lot more clicks on our stuff. So the click-through rate is a lot higher, but it's a little bit cheaper. Big media. Uh, this is something I wouldn't really recommend, but some people do it, like the um, Home Investors guys. So you see the big billboards that they, that they pay for. Um, I don't do radio ads or TV ads or big media, but there's a guy here that I know who does uh, TV ads, and you'll hear some radio ads probably around, around here about We Buy Houses stuff. So, um, But this is it. I, what I think is if, if we're going into big media and we're starting to spend money there, probably do what, we're, what we've been doing and maybe go to another market or something like that to maximize our money. I, I, I haven't dabbled in it. I think it might be a little bit of a waste. So... <clears throat> So pull in a list. So here's what I'd like to do now. I'd like to take a break from this because I feel like I'm talking at you guys. And let's do a little bit of an exercise, and I'll show you how I pull my lists. And we'll do something here. So like if you guys shout out like kind of the area, I'll show you how to use the list provider that I have. And any of you guys can use this. You can buy a big list or a small list. Um, and for a couple hundred bucks, you can just get a list of people to mail. It could be 1,000 or 2,000 people. And we'll talk a little bit about exactly how you can kind of narrow that down in your market. So hopefully it'll stay like it'll stay up the whole time. But here's here's what we'll do. I'll pull, I'll pull out my list source account and then we'll just go through pulling a list and I'll kind of show you guys how to do it so you can do it on your own. This was like one of the biggest things for me when I got started. I was so I was so scared of of this. I didn't understand it and it was like the hardest thing for me to get started was like list source and all these other things I'm going to talk about after this of management of the leads. Um, this was the biggest thing, and if somebody just breaks it down for you very easily, it show you it's not overly complicated. And now I use it all the time. It's, I can pull stuff, like this is just, as an engineer, it's like data nerd stuff that I love. So, Okay, so here, I'm logged into my list source account right here. So I'm going to go to create your own. So right here, you, list source is just a company that uh, pulls data. It's a data aggregator. For, it pulls it from everywhere. I mean, you can, get, you can get cool stuff. You can get age of the homeowner equity um, I'll show you some of the stuff that I pull, but let's go to create your own. So we'll just create our own list right here. So you go to create your own. You got to pick some geography. So let's do a, I'll tell you what, let's do a, you could do zip codes. I, I usually mail counties or you can even draw a map. So, um, let's, let's do a county. So it, why don't you guys shoot out a county for me here? Um, you want to do Williamson County? Yeah. Okay. So Tennessee, and then you can just scroll down through all the counties, Williamson County, and just add it there. So then what it's going to do is it's going to say we got 75,092 records in Williamson County. So then what I do, one of our best producing lists are people that don't live in the house, absentee owners. So these are non-owner occupied houses, so absentee. So let's find out how many landlords there are. And this might be second homeowners and stuff like that, but... Um, so that really narrowed it down, right? We just lost like 70,000 houses. So now we only got 8,476 to mail to. I'd say that's still not good enough for me. So the other thing I have here is 
uh, corporately owned properties, so I excluded any LLCs. So anybody that, and if you want to include those, you can just say no preference. Let's see what that does. That bumps it up. Look, there's 6,000 LLCs that own property in Williamson County. There's a lot of buyers, right? So when I think about that, I say, that's 6,000 people that could buy from me if I was a wholesaler in Williamson County. So, but I probably don't want to mail to them and pull their, pull their records. For you guys, this will probably cost like 14 cents a record. So each name that you buy will cost about 14 cents. I'm lucky and I have a really good deal because I spend a lot of money. Um, property. So I like single family, one to four unit residential. So down here I can do property type and here's an easy click. Single family, one to four unit residential. And one thing that we might take off here is the condos. But I'm going to add that in. What you'll find on this, just a little trick, is it doesn't include mobile homes, but it does include condos. So if you want to add mobile homes, add it. If you want to take out the condos. So we take out the condos this year is what we did. Uh, I realized we were mailing to a lot of condos in Florida last year, and we only bought one. So those numbers weren't good enough for me. So if we remove the condos, now we got 3,093 people that we can mail to. And this is before I put even any other filters on it. All right, so here's the other thing. One more thing we might put on it is equity. So what I would do, let's say we want 50 to 100% equity. Okay, so there's 1,148 records in Williamson County that are absentee owned, that are one to four unit residential, that are 50 to 100% equity. These people have equity. We don't know if they're in any distress. So you can assume you probably get maybe 1% to 2% callback. In, I don't know, in Williamson County, if there's a lot of other people mailing, you might not get that, even that rate. So you have to kind of think of what your numbers look like and based on who you're mailing. Um, so th this is just this is one, like one list that I'll pull. Um, and then I, you might put in, I, I try not to overly filter my stuff. So if you guys are trying to do this, or, or maybe if you're a flipper and you only want to market in a specific zip code, or a specific area, or a map-drawn area. You could market to every house in that area. Just draw a map and just pull the list. It's probably 500 or 1,000 people. Won't cost you that much, a couple hundred bucks. Maybe you get a deal, some phone calls. Um, I did this. I was looking for a lot down in um, Pensacola Beach to build a, a house for us, a vacation home. And I sent a letter, a handwritten letter to like five, five lot owners, and I got three calls. It was just, I was just messing around trying to, find some lots. And I got one that almost took our offer. And we're still in negotiations. I'd still like to buy their stuff. They eventually listed it with a real estate agent. But, um, you know, just taking the time to do this stuff. And I looked up that stuff on the county records. I just went down there and looked at vacant lots and, and draw a map. But this stuff is it's pretty easy. You can see it's not, it's not overly crazy. There's a ton of filters and overlays and things you can do. Um, but you can see this list source stuff is it's, it's not crazy. And then down here you just go to purchase list. And another cool thing in here is you can, so I'll give you another trick. So let's say I pulled all those LLCs, um, or, I, or I, I want to pull this. You can break it down also into zip codes that you can see. Maybe if I'm pulling cash buyers, I can see what cash buyers purchased in certain zip codes. So I could pull all those LLCs and put 100% equity. And then I could go down here to purchase list. And so this, this list cost, it cost me $34. It's not too bad, 1,000 names. And then purchase the partial list, and I can do a custom selection and find the zip codes. So I can take all those houses that we just pulled, 1,100 records. Now I can't, I, and I could, I, if I want to, I could just purchase, like let's say I just want to purchase 37027 or 37064. I could just click that and recalculate, and then I could just purchase those. But I'll tell you what I like to do, is I like to click this export button, and then I email it to myself, and for free, I can get the numbers from that list, like how many in each of those zip codes there are in numbers. So instead of, um, instead of I won't get all the names for free, but I, if I was pulling cash buyers, I could find maybe the top five zip codes in an area that had the most cash transactions in the last year, something like that. And that's what we do when we go into a new market, and we might only want to market to half of it. We might only market to the areas where there's a lot of cash transactions instead of the ones where there's not. So obviously investors aren't buying there. So there's a couple tricks in list source. Uh, pretty easy to do. Um, but yeah, I was scared of this for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ask questions anytime, please. Jump in, yeah. Oh, 
Awesome question. So uh, if we get a call from a lead, um, do we know where it goes? So um, I thought it was the next slide, but it's not. Yeah, yes, I'll, I'm going to get to it. So in order to track, he's, he's at, Tom's asking, if we tra do we track where our leads come from and how do we do it? So well, I'll talk about it. Um, anything else while we're stopped so far? Okay. So then this is what we do. We got our big list, right? So we send them something like this. It's just a simple postcard. And it's got my logo on it. It's got, we're a Better Business Bureau member. We got an A-plus rating down in Pensacola. We got an A in Chattanooga. We're working on our A-plus rating in Chattanooga. So um, this is what it looks like. It's very simple. Um, nothing crazy. We want to buy your house. We pay cash. No realtor fees. No commissions. Call us. Here's what we're going to do. I tell you what we do. We're gonna, just going to come to your house, take a look at it. We'll make an offer on every house we go see. What's the worst thing that can happen? We'll make you an offer. You'll say no. So it's got a phone number on it, like Tom said, 423-509-0411. Uh, Please don't call it. Uh, it's going to bog down my team. But um, each of those numbers is different on every card that we send, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So not, not every card is different, but every campaign will have a different phone number. Yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, Yeah, so we use variable data. So what you're talking about is just like, so Nancy has variable data, um, the address 1727 Ray Joe, and the phone number is variable data. Um, and then on the front, the address of their property on the top and, and the, the mailing address of variable data. But we don't, we don't print all of our cards in-house. We outsource everything. I mean, the, the guy that prints our cards makes one cent per card. So for me to pay one cent per card to send it, so maybe a cent. He might make a cent and a half after postage, but he's got to pay for all the, the you know, the, the postcard and all the all the material and the ink. I mean, we we don't do it in house. It just doesn't make sense at our volume. But yeah, we uh, he use, we use variable data. We just send him the list. They, their software does all the work for us. Um, if you're doing this in house, you might find a software or buy something to print out your letters or your cards. But I think it's pretty cheap, and uh, if you have some money to mail, you should outsource it. Um, it's not worth your time. What you'll find towards the end of my presentation is um, we got to value our time too. So what you guys are, think about what you're doing and how much it costs to outsource that and how much you're wasting by doing it yourself. So, But yeah, uh, we'll talk about the CRM a little bit too. Here's another one that we've used in the past. Um, so it's just a, this one's a little, I, I let, we use the branded postcard now it's just because I want them to see who we are over and over and over again, that we're not going away. I used to alternate different cards and things like that, but this is another one. It's just like a doodle postcard. I thought maybe if we saw, sent some different kind, we might, we might get somebody who would react to this and not the other one. Um, so we kind of would mix and match them every, every month or every couple months um, just to try to get some different leads. Or maybe they think it were somebody else and they don't like us, so they might want to call that person. But it didn't, I mean, we'll talk about it, but you got to kind of, here's the next slide. You got you to track this stuff. So for us, we, I was tr tracking numbers and stuff. That, that, those little things, they just weren't moving the needle at all. Like the, the little change. So everybody's asked, what, what postcard do you use? I just showed you two of our postcards. I mean, you can find this on any, any website. There's nothing crazy. We're not, <clears throat> we're not overly creative. And I've, I've said for a long time that I've, I've, I, at what I do is the same as what hundreds of people have done before me. I have never had an original thought in real estate, I don't think, ever. Um, I just try to take everything from what other people are doing and just be better at it and run a better system and a better company. So that picture was supposed to be some guy staring at a whole bunch of data, right? So for us, tracking is really important. So I need to know, like Tom said, where each of my leads came from. So at the end of the year, I, or at any time throughout the year, I can look at him and say, how did that list perform? Or how did that card perform? Or if we made a change, can we track it in our system? So we use a bunch of different... Um, uh, different sources to track our things, like different phone numbers for different lead sources. We use, um, we'll talk about it on the next slide, but everything that comes in has to be tracked. Um, so, you know, when we pulled that list or we tried that new thing, how many calls did we get? How many of those calls turned into appointments? How many of those appointments got closed? How many of those closings went through and we realized profit from that? How much was the profit? So all of those numbers are now tracked. I didn't do that at the beginning, believe me. We're talking about when it was me, 
it was me, and I was just sending mail, and I was trying to answer the phone, and I was flying, and I couldn't answer the phone. I tried to call people back, and then I wouldn't follow up, and I wouldn't do all the things that I should be doing that we do now. But when it's just you, if you can track stuff, track it. And however you track it is fine. It doesn't have to be an expensive software or an expensive uh, phone program or system. I used Google Voice, so it wasn't my personal phone number because I didn't want a bunch of people that I didn't know having my personal phone number. So I used a Google Voice phone number, and when they called, it had a different message. It said, hey, you've reached Bill. You know, I'm looking to buy houses. Leave your name and number. Because I was flying like 8 to 10 hours a day, so when they call, I usually wouldn't be available, so it would be a voicemail. And then I try to call them back in the evenings or the next morning or the weekend, whenever I could. It could two or three days could go by before I'd call somebody back. I mean, it's embarrassing now, but I was, I was figuring it out, right? But you've got to track. And if you can't track it and can't look at the numbers, you don't know where it came from. If you know what lead source is working, you know where to put more money next year or later that year. So then we use, so the call comes in, we track the call, we know where it came from, we know which list it came from, we know that this is a, maybe an owner-occupied mailer, it's a pay-per-click, somebody came from Google, it's an absentee mailer, it could be, uh, I don't know, they found it on a business card, a networking number, um, Craigslist ad, whatever we have out there. All these different marketing channels that we have looking for leads. Drive the lead, the lead has to go somewhere. Let me tell you how it started. I would take the call, like I said, I'd answer, I wouldn't be able to call, and then I'd write it down on a piece of paper, and I'd put it on my desk. And my desk had all these sheets of paper. Every lead was on there, it had something on there. And then every lead would get stacked up, and the one to the bottom would get on the bottom. So I wouldn't get to it for a long time. And then I'd say, you know, and you might think that I like to talk in front of groups and talk on the phone. I hate talking on the phone. I, I will not answer my phone. Yeah, sometimes when, it's, when I know who it is, I still, I still won't answer it. If I don't have time or I, I, I know what they're calling, I just can't get to it. I, want it, I don't like talking on the phone. I hate it. So I'm not very good at this business, right? Um, when people call, I get nervous. Or I have, know I have to call somebody back, I'll find something else to do instead of calling to make that offer, right? You guys are, if you've ever been in somebody's house and you're talking to them and you're, you're like, man, this is going really well. I've been here for two hours. I'm going to get this house. And then you give them the offer, and they, this guy says, I'd rather burn my house down than sell it to you. And I went, okay, uh, thanks, I'll see you later. This is a guy who had no idea what he wanted for his house. And so we walk outside, and he says, that house sold for $40,000, that house sold for $60,000, that house next door sold for $70,000. The guy just spent two hours telling me he had no idea what his house was worth. And when I told him and educated him and gave him my offer, it was, so I don't like doing that stuff. It's just not the person, I like to make people happy. It's what I like to do. Most of the time. So, so when those calls come in, <laughs> Jeremy. So when those calls come in, I don't want to answer them. Or when those leads are stacked up or it gets difficult, I didn't want to call them back. So I realized that I had to do something. I had to find someone who does like to do that. But in order to do that, you've got to have a system in place. And it could be, it doesn't matter. It, it turned in from those papers. Those papers would get lost or it would be three months. You know when like a month goes by and you're supposed to call somebody back? And then you're like, oh, it's been a month. I can't even call them anymore. I'm like so embarrassed, I can't call. So that's what would happen with these leads, and these good leads would go missing. They'd be gone. I'd just have to say, it's been three months. These leads are gone. So if you get them in a system and have somewhere to track them where you know that they're hot or cold or warm or, or, some, or, or whatever, or here's their phone number and here's their email address instead of, oh, what did I do with that piece of paper? I can't find it. They didn't leave a voicemail. That lead's gone, right? So what we use now is a customer relationship management system, a CRM. So we use a CRM called Podio. So there's a bunch of them out there. There's tons of different CRMs you could use. Um, but that's what we use. Also, very, very scary when you first look at it. So it's definitely, where I started, it was paper. And then I went to an Excel sheet because I'm an engineer and I'm a nerd and I use Excel sheets for everything. So we put the Excel sheet, we put every, all the information in Excel. But then I could track it, right? I could, I could move them up or down. I could, I could change them from yet, red to yellow to green if they were hot or warm or cold leads, and I could see something. And then we went to this where now I have automated follow-up systems, and we can send a text message or an email automatically. We click a button, and there's a loop that we'll send. And I can code stuff on the back end to send notifications to myself or my team or whatever. We can do lots of stuff with these leads. But they get automatically inserted. Yeah? So, Bill, when you um, started Podio, you have to customize it a lot for your use? Or do you take that out? Yeah, yeah, I use a company called InvestorFuse. So, as a good friend of mine, the CEO does 
Um, it, it's, it's a great program. It's basically a wrap in Podio for what we use for wholesaling. So it's basically built for a wholesaler. I've built out a couple of rehab apps for our uh, rehab company and some other things in Podio. Um, but when I started, no, I was doing it all myself. So when I started, I created a couple apps, and I used a system called Globaflow, which um, is a back-end automation system that can, when you click buttons, it can create things. So I just kind of watched YouTube videos and taught myself. Something about me is I have to do everything in my company, it seems, first, except for drywall. I don't do drywall. But I've done, like, I have, I've, I've, I finished a 1,000-square-foot basement in a house in six weeks while I was flying uh, as a test pilot in Pax River. I had my, my wife was like four or five months pregnant painting the basement with me. Um, I had a nice respirator for her and everything. So, um, But it was, uh, I, I have a problem with that. So I will do stuff that I, now I realize I shouldn't be doing these things, but I, I taught myself everything. So then I, I like it because I know when I hire somebody to do it, I know the expectations for them and what it's worth to me. So how hard was it for me to do? What should I pay someone to do? Um, and what do I really not like doing? It's like, where, where, what am I good at and what am I really bad at? And then what you'll see in the last couple slides is I hire out everything that I'm re really bad at, or I try to. And some of the things I'm good at, but other people are better than me. And it, that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes to think that some people are better than you, better than you at doing things. And the other thing that I realized was like 80% of me is still better than... 100%, like if it's just me doing it, but I can have four people that are doing even 70 to 80% efficiency of what I was doing, that's more than just one of me, and I can go do other things. So we'll talk about that some more. But yeah, Podio is, is it's a little scary. And there's some other stuff. There's, I, I know maybe five or six um, different CRMs that people use, but that's what I use, uh, and we, we like it. Uh, it's like, I think that a wrap for investor fees is like $150 a month or something like that that we pay. Um, so that's basically the lead, right? So we, we, find, we find the market, we create our budget, we send out, we find a list or whatever our, whatever our marketing plan is going to be. So Nate, Nate's here, Nate, Nate's my COO. So um, we, we sat down for a whole day, like eight, it was like eight hour meeting, right? And we were planning on doing all this stuff, but all we did was look as, do our, plan our marketing for next year. So like two weeks ago, we just said, and I said, no, this is the most important thing. This is, this is the most important thing that we're going to do right now. So we did it. We planned our marketing, and then it was done. And we, it was just our mail, by the way, just mail for next year. Um, so we pulled six different lists, fine-tuned the list, spent like, probably like, really like six, six to eight hours just doing that. And then I, it was a big relief when it was done. So, I mean, that's, the, that, so that's our, our target market, our budget, our list, and then our mail pieces, sending the mail or doing whatever marketing channel you're doing tracking the inbound information, so tr making sure that you know if it's effective or not and how much. I know to the cent what our, what our absentee mailer in Pensacola did last year or our pay-per-click ads in Pensacola did last year. For every dollar I spent, I know exactly how much I got back from it. And then, uh, so then you send the mail, you track it, and now we're getting into this conversion, right? They called us in, they're in our system, they're in the CRM, and now we've got to figure out how to convert this lead. And this is where, so we're, we're in marketing, and now we're moving to sales. So I'm good. So I'm going to give you all the secrets to sales, and hopefully they show up here. So answer your phone. So what I realized this is this this is the first secret to making your marketing dollar effective is to answer your phone. Um, we we were okay at answering our phones. I was really bad at answering my phone, right? So I pretty much sent like 90% to voicemail. So. What, we, what I found was really the only the really highly motivated people. I mean, we had a lady who called, filled out a lead on my website. I didn't get it in my email. She filled it out again. Then she called again, and we finally bought her house. It's like, it's like she was like knocking on my door with the deed to her house. Like That's how bad she wanted to find us, to sell to us. She's, she, in fact, she's, like my, like, she's on our Facebook page commenting about how great we are still. She's one of our best clients. I, I absolutely love her. Um, and I, I sat at the ta closing table with her, an incredible testimonial about what we did and all the things we did for her. And she even stands up for us on our Facebook ads. So we run Facebook ads and people are like, oh, they'll, like, they'll steal your house or whatever they say. And this, and this one guy said, uh, this, yeah, these are just old grandmothers and you're taking their house. And she just jumped in and said, I'm not an old grandmother and I did not give my house away. It was fantastic. But... but uh, <laughs> I go off on tangents a lot, by the way. So, so answer your phone. 
we answer our phone, like one of our goals this year is to get our live answer rate up as high as we can get it. Um, just because we know that if, they, if you don't answer your phone and they don't leave a message, it's, it's almost impossible to get a hold of these people again. We have no idea. They're just ghosts. We don't know why they called. And it, it just burns inside of me of like, why, even if they were just really mad at us and wanted us to take us off, their, off the list and they don't ever want to get a piece of mail. We had a lady call and say, like, you made me walk out to my house and it's 95 degrees, or out of my mailbox is 95 degrees outside. I said, do you only walk out to your mailbox when you see somebody put something in your mail? So she's really mad at us. Um, but if we answer our phone, now we know why they're calling, right? And even sometimes we'll answer and they'll hang up. So, okay. They, they didn't want to talk to us. But we don't know if we don't answer our phone. So answer your phone. This is secret number one. Secret number two, follow up with these people. So what I was doing in the beginning was I was stacking my paper on my desk and I wouldn't follow up with anybody. And I'd call them once. And I, I'm, I'm still bad at it. I got, I got this house, this lady, she's, I'm working with her. I'm trying to find the right fit. And I was supposed to call her yesterday, but I got busy, so I put it off. I'm going to call her today, I promise. But you've got to follow up with these people. And that's what the CRM does for us. It allows us to put an automated sequence in there that we can follow up, but also it doesn't, it doesn't, stop, it doesn't take away the need for the human follow-up. So we need to be following up. When, the sale, when you get this lead, you need to be talking to them. You need to be following up. It usually takes a lot of these people four to six months before we convert them into a deal. So a lot of it is long-term follow-up that we have. Um, we just followed up with somebody. Somebody had a, uh, we had a house under contract with them, and then they had their, their son was living in the house. So the lady wanted to sell, but she, she obviously didn't want to kick her son out of the house. So she eventually canceled the contract with us. She said, I'm sorry, I just, I just can't sell. And we said, okay, no problem. Just give us a call when you're ready. And my follow-up sequence wasn't great a year ago, but about eight months ago, I spent a day and I cleaned up our follow-up sequence. I wrote a bunch of copyright. I put it all in there. I set it up. I put all the flows in. It's three nice follow-up sequences that we use. And then she got it, she, and she called us back. And I use a, So the follow-up sequencer has a different phone number. So I can track, did I get this lead back from a follow-up? Or was it a new, a new lead? So it came back on the follow-up sequence, and we actually got her house under contract for like $7,000 less than before. She's, her motivation went up. Her son moved out and her nephew moved in and beat up the house a little bit. So we ended up making about six or $7,000 more than we were going to make before on this new, new lead, just from follow-up, just pure follow-up money. I mean, if I didn't set that up, she, she may have gotten a card from somebody else and called them and used them instead. So great deal for us, great deal for the guy that bought it. He fixed it up. He's living in it now, refinanced all his money back. Win, win, win all around. She's happy. We're happy. The guy who bought it's happy. And he's another wholesaler, funny enough. So he lives in that house. That's why we should work with other wholesalers, right? No people, network. Every now and then I get a phone call from a client and they're trying to find financing for a gas station or something unconventional like a um, storage facility. The first name that always comes to mind is our great sponsor, Billy Brown. BillyBrown.me. That's BillyBrown.me. He is a fantastic creative lender. Correct. And can help investors just like you solve any creative lending issues. Maybe you have bad credit. Maybe you have defaulted on loans in the past, or maybe you just don't have the, uh, the history operating properties mm -hmm. to be able to qualify for a big Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. They're great at just focusing on the asset more than the borrower himself. So, I mean, call him to pick his brain. He's always willing uh, to talk to anybody. You would love just talking to him and find, finding out about different ways to be able to finance your investment. Yeah, so Billy Brown, that's billybrown.me. Check him out. So, secret number three. So, number one, answer your phone. Number two, follow up. Number three, anybody? Be on time to the appointment. If you set an appointment with somebody, go to it and be on time. So, I mean, these are like, this is like sales 101, right? Answer your phone, follow up with people, do what you say you're going to do, be on time, be professional, all this stuff. So I think we're getting to the point where there's like, there's not really any secrets here, right? So I Googled, I think I Googled, so I'm coming up with these images, right? I'm looking for stuff last night. What can I talk about? And Seth says, hey, can you send me your presentation last night at like 9.30? I was like, do you think it's ready, man? It's like finishing in the parking lot on the way here. So, um, so I, did put like, I did put one slide in in the parking lot about 7.15. So, but I, got, I, came, I came across something when I was, I think I was Googling like 
sales, uh, sales secrets or something. And I, so I came across this. So I thought, it was, I thought it was hilarious. It's probably, I don't know, 20 years old. But this is like secrets to the perfect interview. So be on time, 10 minutes early. So in the military, uh, on time is late. Early is on time, right? That's what they always said to me when I was coming up in the military. Be positive and relax. Establish rapport quickly. So that's what we want to do from the phone call to the appointment is build rapport. Because if they like us, they'll sell to us. If they don't like us, they're going to find somebody else. I mean, this is just common stuff. Like, be relatable to them. You know, just find common ground. Do things, you know, talk to them. Listen to them. So down here, be a great listener. Establish rapport and listen. I'm pretty bad at that because I like to talk. And I'm this type A person. I like to control the conversation. So not a great listener, and I know it. So I have to work hard in these appointments to sit down and listen. I'm also like, let's get to the point. Here's the number. Do you want it or not? I'm out of here. I don't want to spend two hours with you on your couch because it stinks in here. Or there's, there's fleas all over my legs. Do you feel that? So, but I, I have to change everything about myself to go on appointments with sellers. And I had to train myself to do it because I failed a lot. So we got, it's not easy to do this business. So be a great listener is really important. And I have a, re- I have a, a reference here at the end is a podcast that I listen to a lot. And he talks, he's got an incredible co- podcast that I'll, I'll share with you on, on being, a lis- being a good listener. Um, and you've got to really hear what they're saying. You've got to find out what their problems are. You have to go down that path to find out what the struggle is to see can you help them or if, and paint, paint that perfect picture. So if I could do this, this, and this for you, then you know, can you do this for me? Can we meet here on this number? Because really, like I said before, they're trading equity in their house. They know it for ease of transaction, speed of sale, whatever you can offer them. So you've got to offer them a service for what they can do. So reflect before answering, be enthusiastic, act confident, not cocky. Take, take no longer than two minutes to answer questions. I don't know. It's a, but send a personal thank you note by U.S. Mail. Like, when was the last time we did that? You guys write thank you notes to people that you went to see their house or maybe we bought their house. So right now we're working with our team to go back to the people that, you, that we've done transactions with. We've done like 250 transactions in the last couple of years. Go back and send a note to them. Get referrals. Those, those people should be your network. I'm sure they know other people that could use our service. So things like that. Just the little things about sales. So I thought this was pretty interesting. I just pulled off the Internet. So here's a couple tricks um, when you're on the appointment and things like that. Um, first one, be relatable. So, do you like cats? Oh, I see a picture of cat. I love cats. Yeah, cats are great. They're my favorite. I, I can't stand cats personally. But when I'm in a house with somebody who loves cats, then I love cats. Do you like dogs? I love dogs. You know, do you, do you play tennis? Oh, I play tennis. So, you know, just be relatable to them. Just listen to them, all these things. Just have a conversation with them. You're, you are, they want to talk about stuff, but you've got to get to it. Normally, people say... Yeah. Why are you selling? Oh, I'm d- I want to downsize. Okay. And, and then we'll just move on. Some people might move on. I don't move on. I say, well, what's, what's causing you to downsize? What's going on? Oh, well, we want to move up to North Carolina. Okay. What's going on in North Carolina? Uh, my, uh, my daughter, uh, she just had a baby, and the baby's sick. So we want to move up to North Carolina to be with them, be with our grandson. Okay, oh, that, where in North Carolina? And I have that conversation. So I just got from want to downsize to we want to move to North Carolina to be with our sick grandson. It's like how quick do you need to move to North Carolina? You know, now we go into a totally different conversation than if I said, oh, they want to downsize. That makes sense. They're getting older. They want to downsize. They got equity in their house. There's no motivation there if they want to downsize. Like we got to go down that path until we get to the end or a point that I don't want to probe any further come back out and start talking about something else, maybe something about the house. But it's not really about the house when we're dealing directly with sellers. It's about what's going on in their life and their motivation. If we don't find their motivation in their picture-perfect future, then we can't help them, in in my industry at least. Maybe a a realtor probably is better for them, right? Or like why they can't keep it on the, put it on the MLS. So we have to ask a lot of sensitive questions in this business when we're on appointments. And the biggest thing for me is how do I ask that question? So... Would you like it if I asked you, hey, how much do you make a year? It's probably going to be like, get lost, man. Or, ah, it's kind of a personal question. But if I was like, hey, I, I bet you make like a million dollars a year. Probably going, ah, I don't make a million. I might make like 800000 
Uh, and so I, that's how I can get to his answer, because he's probably going to do something if I just assume the positive. So uh, income is one thing. Mortgage. Mortgage is a difficult question, right? It's like, do you have a mortgage? So I have to work with my team on the phone about this, is how do we get the information about mortgage and payments and things like that, because we might want to do some creative financing. So how much is the mortgage on your house? They've gotten a lot of pushback from that. It's like, get lost. Like, I'm not telling you that. It's personal. So we might ask something like, uh, have a conversation with them about, if, if I'm on the appointment, I usually like, well, what are you going to, you know, maybe a $100,000 house, what are you going to do with $100,000? You might say, oh, I'm not going to get $100,000, I've got to pay the bank $80,000. So I just got their payoff basically right there. Or on the phone, I might say something like, oh, this is a rental house, how much do you rent it for? They say, well, I rent it for $1,000 a month. $1,000 a month, what do you do with all that money that you get? Well, I got a $600 mortgage payment. So we have that, we just kind of ask the question without asking the question. Try to work around these questions that are difficult. Listen to them. We talked about this a couple times. But find out their needs. Like, what are the needs? Really find out what they need. It's not about what you need. It's not about the price that you need to get the house. It's about what they need. If those two can, can merge and we can find a happy ground, then we can sell them on our services and things like that. We're going to usually have to meet somewhere. So they're going to have to give a little bit. We might have to give a little bit. But we've got to find that that solid ground. Um, handling objections. So we try to get all this stuff out of the way in the beginning. So when I'm talking to sellers about, it's, it's not like they don't know they can list their house on the MLS. It's not a secret. They know what realtors are. They don't have to hide it. So usually the first thing I do when I walk in the house is like, why would you sell a nice house like this? And that's almost the first question I ask just about everybody, unless I'm going in with a tenant or something like that. But it immediately tells them, I want them to sell to me. It's almost like reverse selling, right? So why would you want to use our service? You could just list this on the MLS with a realtor. It's not like I avoid that question. I get it out of the way in the beginning. So they, they say, well, oh, I had a lady, I went into her house and I said, I said, this is, I mean, you can sell this house. She just bought it like nine months ago. Why don't you list this house on the MLS? Well, I don't want anybody coming through my house. I got all the antiques in here. I can't stand people coming through my house. There's no way I'm going to let a realtor and a bunch of people come through my house and I'm not going to be here and all this stuff. I got this stuff worth millions of dollars in here. It was not. But she thought it was. But I was listening to her, and that was her biggest problem, was she needed to move. Her daughter had cancer. She wanted to go buy a condo. She knew exactly how much the condo was. She knew exactly what she needed. All we had to do was just get, get there. All we had to do was get, that, get her that number. And she just didn't want all that stuff. She could have got more money. We just bought it and put it on the MLS. She knew that we were going to do that. I told her. She didn't care. She just wanted her $60,000 so she could go down and buy the condo. And when she needed a $1,000 down payment, I gave it to her. And she went and paid the $1,000 down payment, so she had it. And we, double, we closed hers and closed theirs, and I just wired the money straight down to them, and it was done. I mean, was, so that's what some people need sometimes. And they know this stuff, but if you handle that stuff up front, it's going to make it a lot easier. So then you don't get it under contract, and then two weeks later they call and say, Hey, I'm canceling the contract, or they don't stop responding to you because they, they met with a realtor the next day and they signed a contract with them and they don't want to sell it to you because the realtor told them it's worth $200,000. And that's what they're going to sell it for. So we handle that stuff up front. Just get all that stuff out of the way. Fix it up yourself. I usually say, well, why wouldn't you just fix this up yourself and rent it out again? I'm not dealing with these tenants anymore. They've been beating my house up. I'm tired of it. I just want to get an, as a guy, I just want to get an RV and drive. So I don't want to deal with tenants anymore. I just want the money. So you find out all this stuff. Get the, just don't be afraid to ask those questions when you're talking to sellers. <laughs> so this is my favorite one. They say the number. And, and when, I'm talking to, when I'm negotiating, I don't ever give somebody the number. Like I, I will, I'll try 20 times to get it out of them, what they want, what they need, what, the, what their number is, before I give them a number. If I have to give them a number, I might, but usually not. And then... I, I usually make it a little bit uncomfortable. So if they give me the number, I'll just, hmm. Are you guys uncomfortable right now? <laughs> yeah, it's uncomfortable, right? <laughs> I mean, Gomez is like, oh, I got to say something. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, and, and, then, and then they might say something else. I've had times where I've said, they've said a number, and then they've said a lower number. Like a second later. It's just because I was uncomfortably awkward and quiet. And I was like, dude, this guy's negotiating against himself. How long can I stay quiet? <laughs> and my problem is that not very long. <laughs> so, and then I'll usually say, is that the best you can do? And I might even get more. So on our website, we have a two-part form. And it says, 
uh, it says, like, what, is your, what do you want to get for your house? And then it says, if we could pay cash and close in seven days and uh, no real estate commissions, what would you take? And it's like, they put $10,000 less in that box. It's just, I just scratch my head and go, this is crazy. If they do that, negotiate a computer like that, I want to get them in person. So, and I use this a lot, is that the best you can do? I mean, I, I used it at the, uh, get my oil change the other day, the guy knocked like 10 bucks off. So all I just said was, is that the best you can do? And then usually I say, you got a military discount usually? <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, just ask this question. I, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a challenge. Go out today, you're out there doing whatever you guys do, just ask somebody this. Is that the best you can do? I mean, seriously, at a retail shop, just say, is that the best you can do? They might say, oh, I might have a coupon back here. It's crazy. It's very powerful. So, all right, last secret before we move on. Ready? Follow up. Okay, so seriously, follow up, follow up, follow up. This is the biggest thing for us. If you follow up, you'll get more deals. We find that after about six months, you might go on an appointment after about six months, we'll get, we'll get some deals from, from follow-up. When I have a new salesperson come in and start making offers on houses for us, right about the six-month window is when they see their kind of hockey stick, their spike in, in sales, because they're, starting, they're filling their pipe from before. So a lot of salespeople will say, you know, fill in the pipe, my pipe is full, that stuff. But they, they'll start seeing this, this spike, because not only are they getting it and they're getting better at it, but they also have a ton of follow-ups. And as long as they're doing that, they'll get it. So, okay, so next is we've got the lead generation, we've got the lead conversion, and now we go to the fulfillment, client fulfillment. So the biggest thing here for me as a wholesaler is maximizing the profit of our deal. If you're a landlord or a flipper and you're going direct to seller, you're pretty much done here, right? You're using your money so, or somebody else's money, some private investor, but you're pretty much done. You, take it, you run title, you take it to closing, you're done. For us... Now, we, now our job starts, right? We've got to market and sell this contract. So this is, this is where we get into maximizing our profit and actually realizing it. As a flipper or landlord, you might realize it right away as a landlord, or as a flipper, you might realize it three to six months later. But for us, it's our, it's our buyer's list. So it's a big thing that we need to do. So I found this on the Internet, too. It's probably copyrighted again. 50 proven list-building strategies. So I'm going to give you all 50 right now. You ready? I don't really have 50, but I'll give you a bunch of stuff that we use. And I'm going to start with this one. That is all of our buyers list. So the first one is networking, okay? So I'm doing that right now. I'm in this room networking with you guys, trying to build my network and my list and buyers. So we wholesale in Chattanooga. In case you want to buy in Chattanooga, you can go to this website and sign up. We're now wholesaling in Clarksville and Hopkinsville, Kentucky. So if you want to buy in that area, you can sign up there. But this is the kind of stuff that you want to do to build your list. So those are squeeze pages, basically. So I have, I have, um, I have websites that I've created that house our properties and our contracts that we're selling. And what it's, what it's meant to do is we use it everywhere. On the back of my business card is one tip. If I give you a business card today, on the back, it'll have our pages. So every, every RIA meeting I go to, it's on my business card. Somebody says, hey, put me on your list. Uh, hey, man, if you really want to be on my list, you can go to this website, and it's right here on the back. Here's my card. Go home or do it on your phone. You can go on your phone right now to those websites and put your information in, and you're automatically on our list. It automatically adds you to my database. You'll get an email when we get a deal. You'll get a text message when we get a deal. You might get a voicemail drop that, when we get a deal, and all of the things that we use in our company to get our buyers to go look at our properties. So... Networking is one, real estate clubs, real estate investment clubs. I, I'll, that's why I started coming here, to be perfectly frank. I wanted, you know, uh, starting to wholesale in Chattanooga. I figured there's probably some people in Nashville that are getting fed up and might want to go to Chattanooga. So that's why we started coming to these meetings. And I started really enjoying this one, so I keep coming. Um, there's some other ones that I've gone to a couple times, and I don't go back. But, um, but that's a big part of it, networking. Um, business cards, Craigslist ads. So we get a lot of buyers from Craigslist. We put our properties, our, selling our contracts, our signable contracts on Craigslist. At the bottom of every one of ours, it says, if you don't like this property, we have more. Sign up here. Look at our other investment deals here. They go to our website. Sign up. Um, when I was just getting started, and you guys are, some of you might just be getting started in wholesaling, I would just call somebody that I knew, another flipper, and say, hey, I got this deal. Are you interested in it? Or I might even call them before I put it under contract because I'm not sure. I'm scared, right? So I would call people and text people, and we don't really do that anymore. I don't think it's fair. We just send it out to everybody. 
Everybody gets the opportunity to see it. There's not one buyer that we have. We don't have a special VIP list. We don't have all this other stuff. We just, everybody has the opportunity to buy it. It could be your first one. It could be your hundredth one. I don't care. Everybody follows the same process. We run a system and a business now. So let's see, what else do I have? Um, we do a lot of stuff on Craigslist. When I was just getting started, we might put an ad on Craigslist that has a property that we've done in the past to try to get some buyers. Or, find, or I put an ad on Craigslist that just says, um, hey, we, we buy, uh, or we, we're, we're new wholesalers in the area. We're looking for buyers. If you're looking for properties, you know, send me an email or jump on our list. Um, what else do we do? Some Facebook ads now. We do some paid Facebook ads for buyers um, where we've gotten some from th uh, that way. Um, really just, I tell you, networking is the best way to do it. Um, to build our list, networking has been my, my best. Uh, there's a, the real estate club in Pensacola. There's a lot of people that have bought uh, contracts from us in Pensacola that way. Um, what else? Anything else that we do? Facebook. Facebook. Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> so Facebook. Um, there might be people in different groups. You can kind of friend them and send them a message and see if they, they're interested in buying off-market properties and actually doing the work, right? Not this, these easy ways of uh, these special like squeeze pages and stuff. Um, but actually, you know, going in and uh, LinkedIn, stuff like that. We use LinkedIn to try to find buyers and people in the area that are real estate investors. So just, and that's just, that's just virtual networking, right? So that's the best way. Um, so then what we do, so we've got the property now, we got it under contract, we're, we've built our list, we've got this list, and now we need to house this list somewhere. So we use, we use an email server that just houses our list because we've got like, I don't know, Pensacola, probably like 1,500 people in there. Uh, Chattanooga, I don't know, so we got 500 or 1,000 now. Um, and so we use MailChimp, but there's a bunch of different services that I just put up there for you guys. Uh, AWeber's one, Active Campaign. You could build it into your CRM. So our CRM has the ability to send emails out via Podio. You can house your buyers list in the CRM. Uh, you can just, when I first got started, I had like 20 buyers. I just blind CC'd them all in a regular email from my personal email. Put it together, here's the house, this is it. It wasn't anything special. And the cool thing is it went to their inbox, not their spam or their promotions tab in, in Gmail and stuff like that. So. As a wholesaler, I struggle with that. We got 1,700 people on the list, 35% open rate. So I got 65% of those people either don't open it or don't get it. So yeah, that's some problem that I have to combat too. Um, text blast, voicemail drops, we talked about that. There's lots of different ways. We text a lot now. We text our deals out because I don't think everybody's getting the, the email. Text has got like a 90, 98% open rate. Nobody wants to see that like one or two or three on their phone, right? So... Um, and then this is what it looks like. We'll just put together a marketing. So we're, we're, in, we're in the fulfillment stage, right? So sales and marketing again. So this is it. I mean, this is what our property, this is what it looks like. This is just one that I pulled that I found in my inbox. Um, so selling the assignable purchase contract on the property above, address. If you click on the address, you'll go to the uh, Google Maps uh, of the property. If you click on the picture, I think you go to uh, the pictures of the property or um, something like that. And then, uh, so we just put a market rental rate. Bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage. Click to the photos. You can see all the a link. We have a, a Google Drive, all the photos. Yeah. Bill, where do you get your market rental rate? In Pensacola, it's pretty easy for us. I kind of know uh, the market. We, we use a combination of Rent-A-Meter, uh, maybe uh, other comps that we saw on Zillow, and then if we have access to the MLS, we'll pull some of that stuff. I find the MLS is usually a little lower because the realtors, I think, don't uh, get as much out of their property as I can get. So in Pensacola, it's kind of easy for me because I know the market there. I have rentals there. Um, in Chattanooga, it's a little bit harder for us. Um, here, here's, my, here's my push on it is do the best that you can. But we used to put ARVs on here after repair values, for those of you who don't know, for the flips. But we don't do it anymore. Just, and we used to put repair numbers on there. So what I thought it was going to be in repairs and I thought the ARV was going to be, I stopped doing it because it's like everybody and their brother just were complaining about it or arguing with me. Nobody ever said it was too low. Um, but everybody said it was too high or the repair numbers are too high. So I just let them figure it out. Like, hey, look, I, I'm, I've done all this other stuff. You, I'm sorry, you've got to figure out your ARV. You've got to find your number. I, I got it as, as best of a deal as I can. I think it's good. I sent it to you. You guys, you guys work on that. Do the walkthrough. Look at the photos. Try to figure out what, what it is. It's just, for us, it was too much back and forth. And, you know, I, I, was, I just, it was bogging, bogging up my team, too. So, look, I, we got people that are general contractors that buy from us. We got people that do their own work that buy from us. We got people that hire really expensive general contractors that buy from us. So everybody's got a different number. And everybody wants to argue with me about like, how much we're making on the front, but nobody ever comes to me when they flip their house and they make an extra ten or $15,000 and say, hey, man, here's your cut of that, right? So 
I don't know. We just do the best we can. So take it for a grain of salt. If you get stuff from a wholesaler, don't assume any of it is accurate. I'll tell you, even for me. Like, do your homework, and then we'll get to it in a second, but tell me what your truth is. Like, tell me where you need to be. Let me go back and do the work for you, and we'll work together. So, um, yeah, we, we use whatever we can in different markets and, and stuff like that. Maybe some experience. Yeah? Do you sell a deal to a flipper or something? Do you ever do a deal where you get paid on the back end? I, I am willing to do that. Anything creative like that, I would do. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, nobody ever is that creative with me, but I would. Um, I have done, so we did a wholesale deal where I held the, I held the note, so um, we, took, we put our fee into the note on the back, um, so when they sold it on the back, then they would pay down the note. Um, so we, we, we got a fee and got interest on it. It's the only real creative thing that we've done. I have some partnerships that I've done. I've worked with another wholesaler where he brought the buyer and I paid him like three or 4000 bucks. Um, but we're at the point now where I don't really like working with other people unless we can control the deal, just because I, I feel like... I want to be really ethical, and I want to make sure that we, we can do what we say we're going to do. So we've tried to do some JVs and stuff like that in the past where uh, it just hasn't worked out. Just because we didn't start with the deal, we didn't have contact, contact with the seller, things came up, it just wasn't what it seemed. And unless somebody like, really knows what they're doing or lets us take over, then I'm more than willing to share the profit completely. No problem. Like, they bring the deal. So i got a guy who brings deals to me, and we partner 50-50 on the flips. I bring the money. He brings the deal and does the work. And we do, we flip houses together, and he usually brings them from other sources outside of us. And it's, it's a great relationship. But, yeah, I think creative stuff like that is really important, and I'll get to that. Because working, I'll just kind of talk about working with a wholesaler and how you can do business like that. It's really cool. If, if they can be creative and you can be creative, it's, it's a good relationship. So here's, here's our process now. So I found this. I thought it was, like, the funniest thing. This is on a, um, like, a a lawyer's website about, like, don't wholesale. Some guy's, like, flipping a contract. Pretty funny. Um, so that's us right there, the wholesaler. And that's, like, I guess that's, like, the attorney or something. So <laughs> I kind of just put it up for a giggle. So we, uh, so we do all this stuff. But then we got to run title. we got to make sure that there's marketable title. And a lot of times we'll do that on the front end before we send it out just because we've had a lot of problems in the past where the buyer will come in, We'll get it all wrapped up, and then we'll find out that it needs to go through probate or something. They've got to wait three months to get the deal. It doesn't make us look very good. So um, we try to work through a lot of that stuff in the front end if we can and then turn it over. So uh, I'm not really going to get into working with the title companies and getting through, like, probates or any issues or sticky stuff, but we have to do all that stuff too. So if you think of it, like, our process is really we find the deal, we negotiate the contract, we send it to the title company, we do the title work, we take all of that, all that time and effort and, and risk and all that stuff, and then we give it to you on a silver platter at this number. All you got to do is show up at closing, wire your money, and you have the house. Or the, that's it. It's done, right? So we're doing all of that. And so I didn't realize that when I got started. I was like, these guys stand up at the RIAs and flash their $10,000 checks all over the place. It's easy. And I realized it's not easy. So... Here's some tips to working with us, or any wholesaler for that matter. Um, <laughs> I thought this was pretty funny. Together since 1952. So we're working together. Like, we are the team, right? We, we have the deal with the seller, but we work together. Just like you talked about, how can we get the deal done? Like, we're, we're not enemies. We're not combatants. Give, give, figure out what works for you. Let, let us work together. Like, let's find a way to get this deal done. We've had deals. We did one in Chattanooga where um, we, I think we we're going to make like 1000 bucks, and it just wasn't worth it. So we just put the seller and the, and the buyer in contact with each other, and they did the deal. I was like, this is, it's getting too convoluted. It's too much trouble. So let's just, just give them the information. They can work it out and see if they can get it wrapped up. And they did. And I think the guy, I think the guy sent us a check for like 100 bucks or something, but I didn't ask for that. Um, it cost me a lot of money to run my team and, and find these deals. Like every deal costs us about $2,500 to get minimum. And then I also have a lot of overhead on top of that, like hourly people and stuff like that. So it's expensive for us to run the business. So, but we're working together as the flippers and landlords. Like the wholesalers are out there working for you. Leverage them. Let them do all that work. You flip houses or you hold, buy and hold houses. Let us go do the work. Let us find it. Let us negotiate it. Let us, put, let us take all the risk and put all the money into marketing. You know? So that's, that's what I, I preach a lot is we're really providing a service for, for you, but we're working together here. So let's find a way to work together. Um, if you go look at the house and you, and you worked your numbers, 
and you spent all that time doing all that work, make an offer. It doesn't matter if it's $50,000 off from what I'm asking. Make an offer. If I don't get an offer from someone and we're getting down to the wire where I either have to buy it or we have to, it, the repairs are just too high or the ARV came in too low, you guys as, as the buyers are really out there looking and finding the truth about the house that maybe we missed, something like that. I got to figure out what our plan is as a company. If I have an offer, we can go back and let us do the work. Let us negotiate the price back. Let us find, you know, give us the feedback that you have and make an offer. So you never know. You might be the only person that made the offer and we can find a way to make it work. So I tell people this all the time is if you, if you spend all the time looking at the house or crunching numbers, like just submit an offer. What's, I mean, it's just an email. It's a number. You came up with a number. Here's where I have to have it. I like it, but not at your number. Here's my number. Okay, let's see what we can do. It's very rare that people take me up on that, but that is the biggest takeaway that I have now running a wholesaling company and being a flipper and, and as a flipper before is now if I see something I like, I just make a number. I made a number on a house down in Spring Hill. It's like four streets down from me. I don't really buy stuff around here that often, but it was somebody I knew and she asked me and I said, yeah, I'll buy it. Here's my number. She said, okay, I'll take it. And it's fine. I'll probably make like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 on it, but... It worked for me. I went to look at it. If I went to look at it and spent all that time, why wouldn't I just tell her what I could do? Do what you say you're going to do. Don't, don't put in earnest money deposit. Don't sign a contract with a wholesaler. Don't tell them you're going to do all this stuff and you have the cash and then not show up at closing or go dark or do all that stuff. It's very, it's, we've got one right now. we got an offer. We sent the contract. It's been three days. Haven't heard from them. Can't get a hold of them. It's just poor business. Uh, I had a guy who asked for a lower earnest money deposit. He didn't want to pay the, what, we're, what, we're, what we're doing. And about two years ago, I accepted that. I said, okay, yeah, you don't want to pay our $2,500 non-refundable deposit. A thousand bucks is fine. And then uh, two days before closing, he sends me a text, and he's like, ah, we can't do it. I said, what? And yeah, we want our earnest money back. I said, well, excuse me? You signed a contract. Let me highlight what it says in the contract. And it's a $100,000 house. I had to use $100,000 of my money. And it's, it cost me a lot more than a thousand bucks to find a hundred thousand dollars in two days. I don't know if you ever guys ever tried to do that, but it costs more than a thousand dollars. And if you ever need that, just let me know. Um, this is a joke. Um, but the so the, so the guy won't do business with, with I won't do business with him ever again. Two years, and he opens every one of our emails. Uh, he might be watching this, um, but I won't do business with him. It's just I, I said, here's your options. You can take your money back, or you can never do business with us again. And he said, okay, we want our money. I said, all right. How much money did that guy lose over $1,000? It's like, I still remember the conversation. It's, it's frustrating. So just do what you say you're going to do. If you're going to make an offer, you know, stick to it. Because we're going to do what we say we're going to do. Um, and if you work with somebody like that, then, then make sure that you're doing it. As a real estate broker, I recommend to anybody that's about to purchase an asset, whether it's a, a primary residence or an investment property, to always get a home inspector to go check that property for anything that might be wrong with it. Kind of a no-brainer, but it's one of those things that I think a lot of people cheap out on. They want the cheapest guy, not always who's the best guy. Dave Ganatra with House on the Rock Home Inspections, he will get in there and find every single thing that could be potentially wrong with your place that you're about to buy. I am telling you, he will get in that crawl space, man. He will fight a raccoon for you. Yes. So you can check him out, Dave Ganatra, at House on the Rock Home Inspections. That's H-O-T-R inspections.com. Again, H-O-T-R inspections.com. So real quick, I know I'm running out of time. So I got two slides on scaling and just mentality shift for me to how I went from one person to now I counted this morning. We're a team of 18 today. So we've, we grow a couple more people recently. So, uh, and our goal uh, this year in 2018 is $3 million in, in gross. So, um, so scaling, hiring's the key. If you get over that hurdle early, it's good. So if like, I don't know, hire some kid to mow your grass to save an hour every week. And, and that, that was big for me. Just starting to do things like that and figuring out what your time's worth. So I took all the money that I made in, in 2016, I think it was, no, 2015. And I said, how much money did I make and how, much, how many hours did I work? And I figured out what my cost per hour was at that time. It was, I think it was like $54 an hour. So what I did was anything less than $54 an hour, I tried to hire out if I could. And, um, 
And that's, that's kind of been the way of my thinking from now on. Like, I want to be a $1,000 an hour guy now. So less than that, I try to hire that stuff out. Like, what can I do? I have a, uh, I just hired a personal assistant. I, I mean, Yogi was here a couple months ago, and I went to a meeting with him, and he had a personal assistant, like, set up the meeting, and I didn't, he didn't talk to me, and I thought it was incredible. So once I could afford it, I hired one, and she th- manages all my email, personal schedule, stuff like that. It was a huge change for me. I was spending three or four hours in my email a day, just, like, reading them and filing them and doing all that stuff. So it's great. Um, but now it's kind of a... It's kind of an addiction. I go to every like, quarterly meeting with the company now, and they're like, oh, who's coming in here now? Who, how many new people are we going to have? This, this? I'm like, we're not hiring any more people. And then three more people show up every meeting. So incentivize your people to work hard for you. If you can find the things that you want them to do, and you put an incentive on it, whether it's money or whatever, you find out how, how your people are motivated, and you incentivize them that way for that thing that you want them to do, don't just tell them to do it, tell them to do it, tell them to do it. Incentivize them to do it. Like, find a way. If they're money motivated... Put the incentive on the thing that you want them to do and do it well and do it fast, and they'll do it. Um, If they're not money motivated, then you really got to find out what does motivate them. Maybe put them in a a managerial role or a position where they can thrive, and that's really what they care about. And maybe they want to run a team of two or three people, and that's what motivates them and it's not money. Put them there. Um, Scale responsibly. Hire for where you want to be and not where you are now. So that was big for me. I, I was like waiting until I had enough volume to hire the next person and waiting to hire the next person. And I was wait- people were redlining. Like we were, oh, their cups were overflowing. They were redlining. So if I hired earlier, it would have smoothed that process out a little bit. And just, you know, look at the future and figure out the, ho- the hiring and the pay up front. So that was big for me. And start with the end in mind. So what does it look like in the future? I mean, we're trying to do 10-year planning now, which is like, pff, I can't even do it. It's, it's really hard for me to do that stuff. Even two or three years. I mean, I, uh, so, you know, Start thinking about the future and what it looks like um, and be proactive and not reactive. Everybody's reactive. Start thinking. If you can think ahead of the problems, we have a lot of people in the company that can't think like this. So, um, like, they can't see the problem until it smacks them in the face. Uh, and I can watch it develop on email or uh, in text messages or however we're communicating in, in uh, the CRM mainly. I'm just like, ah, the closing's not going to go well. And I'll just say, sometimes it's really hard for me not to jump in. And now I've got to kind of wait for them to fail and see the issue and fix it. But... Uh, if it keeps happening, you've got to do something about it. So uh, mindset, you're doing it now in here. Surround yourself with the people who are doing more than you. So I, I don't ever want to be the smartest guy in the room doing the most in the room. So I'm always looking for another room to go to or another place to go to. So now I pay for the rooms that I'm in. So the, the, the way that I got here was I, surra- I surrounded myself with people who were doing like 10 times what I was doing or 100 times or 1,000 times. And I knew that if I got in that room that I would catch up. Or I would find a way to be the best. And then i got to find another room. And I just kept doing that. So I pay a lot of money for my education and the people I surround myself with. I'm in a mastermind. I pay $25,000 a year to be in. And that's, that's what I did. I did that in your, when I did that one flip, $43,000 profit. I paid $25,000 to go into that room. And that's what got me to $500,000 that year. And then I paid again, and it got me to $1.3 million. So I really think that that's, that's a big thing for me. Because I could just take ethically steal everything that they're doing and do it in my business and and I paid for the speed of growth in my company. Um, permission, they removed the glass ceiling for me. I'm going to remove it right now from all of you guys. It's possible to make a million dollars a year. Like it, believe it or not, like net a million dollars of profit in a year. When I heard that, I thought it was crazy. I sit next to guys in my mastermind group that make one or two million dollars net. They put it in their bank in a year. That's all what I wanted to do my whole life. So, and it might not be about, about money for you, it didn't turn into money for me. I thought it started with money, but now what it is is about growing my people and watching them make six figures a year when they thought they never could. And all the success that my people are having right now in my company is all a part of what we've done and you know, where I started by myself and the vision that I had and surrounding myself with those people and seeing them all be successful is really what drives me now. Like, I don't care how much money I make. I, I really, I mean, I kind of care, but... But I, want to, I like the freedom. I like to have my time off. I like to tinker with stuff. I like to turn the dials. I don't like to answer the phone, and I know that. So, you know, I just brought Nate. Nate's the COO of my company now. Brought him in this year, and I can't wait to see what he can do. And I can't wait to see him be more successful in this than what he was doing before. So, like, the biggest thing for me is bringing people in. He doesn't have to drive two hours to and from work every day. He can be at home with his family. We can live virtually. We can work hard, and we can do, run, a, run, a, run a great business. So... Remove the glass ceiling from your head. There is no limit to what we can do and, and what you can achieve 
financially, personally, emotionally, whatever. It's gone. Like, break through it because I've had it, I've had it above my head my whole life. And when I sat next to this guy who, I don't know, dressed like me, shorts, T-shirts, driving an Acura just like me, like, he's just this multimillionaire. You would never know. He's the nicest guy in the world. And he doesn't fly on private jets because he can. He just, he just lives his life, has a great family, and is, runs an ethical business. And I think, it's, I think it's great. Action and implementation, can't do anything without that. I mean, this is the biggest thing here. If I didn't take action and implement all the things that other people were doing, uh, I wouldn't have done anything. So here's a couple resources that I like. You can't read it, but... Um, <laughs> Millionaire Next Door is, was the book that changed my mindset on, on money and, and how I spend money. I've always been really frugal and, and cheap. You ask my wife, she gets really upset about it. Um, then The Millionaire Real Estate Investor with Gary Keller and The One Thing. Both those books were really great. Uh, the Compound Effect with Dar Darren Hardy. I thought that, that book was really good. I really enjoyed it. it, it I mean, that's anywhere from life to uh, fit, physical fitness to anything. Um, Traction, Gino Wickman. This, this really is how I've tried to run my business the past couple of years. So it's just... Uh, not exactly like this book. Um, the other thing I didn't put up here was the E-Myth, Michael Gerber. So that's a really good book. That, that one and Traction go really well together to kind of grow and scale your business and run a, 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 an actual business. And then uh, here's a couple podcasts I like. So I found my mastermind with the uh, Justin Williams podcast, House Living HQ podcast. If you go back to some of the earlier podcasts that he did, I thought they are really, really good about systemizing. That's what I was listening to when I was driving to and from that job site every day, going, this guy's flipping 125 houses without ever looking at him. How is he doing that? And then, so that's, that's, that's the mastermind group that I joined. I said, I just wanted, I want that system. And now I have it. So it, that, that, was, that was big for me. So cool podcast about systemizing your business and like leveraging other people. And then the Brian Buffini podcast, this is one of my favorite. This is the mindset and success, mindset methodology of success mastermind or uh, podcast. He is incredible. Um, and he talks about the art of listening. That's a great one. Um, there's some really good stuff on reflection at the end of the years. And this is just really powerful for being a, being a great person. Um, so this is like my questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I know I don't have a lot of time. And uh, I'll blame Seth for going over on the intro. Um, and probably all the tangents. But uh, I don't know if you guys want me to jump down for questions or we can just ask. I know it's, it's getting close to time. So. A few more minutes. Uh, anybody got any questions? You've got a obviously a black belt in uh, in real estate, successful guy. So use this opportunity. Does anybody got any questions for Bill? Yeah, just for the people listening here. So you you said you um, planned out your postcard, your mailing campaign for a year. So are you mailing when you pull that list? Are you mailing that list at a certain incremental time period for an entire year? Yeah, so that was all part of the planning. Um, last year, I mailed everybody every uh, two months. So what I did was I doubled the size list that I could mail. So I think we were mailing 50,000 a month towards the end of last year. So I could pull a list of 100,000 people and mail them every eight weeks instead of every four. So what we did this year was we just played with that a little bit based on the return that we were getting on the, on the cards that we mailed last year. So um, this year, we, we mail between four and eight, depending on the list. So some people might get it every month from us. Uh, but as far as pulling the list, I usually don't refresh the, refresh the list um, at six months at the earliest. Um, it lists are pretty expensive for you guys now. Um, so I try not to spend, wait, I think we spent like $4,000 on our list this year. So is that right? 3500 four grand. So I don't really want to spend that every six months. Um, but you can also, one thing that you can do in list source is you can, if, if you do it less than six months, you can exclude all the names you already bought. So if you do it like five months and... I don't know, five months and two weeks, you can, you can only get the new names. So that's a one way that you can not spend a lot of money to ref kind of refresh your list with new people. It won't take anybody off, but yeah. yeah. If you're here, who just emailed me a property in Georgia? <laughs> <laughs> this is, so, so, that, <laughs> that's, so he said he just got a property emailed from me. Um, so I, that, that is the beauty, I think, of automating your business is for me, I remember sitting in that first mastermind meeting and I was getting phone calls, text messages, emails. Um, and then the, even the, the second one was worse. The second meeting that I sat in and the two guys running the mastermind were sitting back there. They're, they never touched their phone once or their computer once. And I got three emails from the guy, my mentor, for properties that he was selling. And I said, I, I'm going to get there. I don't know when, but I'm going to get there. 
And that was the biggest thing for me was they didn't ever look at it. They, they, they work like five hours a week in their company. I mean, they, it's, it's incredible. So I, I just made it a point to, to get to that point sometime. But yeah, he, he used to send it to me. My dispositions guy used to, hey, can you check this out? Can you manage it? I don't, I, frankly, I don't, know what, I don't even know what house that is. And it's pretty cool when you get to that point. And that's, I mean, that doesn't have to be where you go, but it, that's where I wanted to go because I want to spend time with my family. I want to do those things. And, um, and I want to give those other people power to, to send that out, to make those decisions, to stand by them, you know? So, and that's what's really cool about the real estate business is, you know, it, it, it will operate without me. We went to Disney for a week. And I, I, it was only because I was tied to one of the flips that we were losing money on did I have to take a phone call on Wednesday. But the rest of the time, I didn't even look at my email. Uh, it built up pretty big. I get about 150 emails a day. Um, and I'm CC'd on a lot of stuff. But my assistant flagged them all and moved them all and set them all up for me. And then when I got home, I could just knock them all down. I'm going to be behind when I get done this. But it's just, you know, I don't, don't necessarily have to answer them all. But, yeah, it's, it's, that's pretty cool. I think that's the beauty of of this business of real estate is automating it and removing yourself if possible. So it's hard. Yeah. You have to look at the end and work your way back. So yeah. One more question for Bill. Anybody else? Yeah. With you primarily being focused on areas outside of where you live, who would you say are the, the minimum team members or partners that you really need to start looking at those outside areas to actually build a scalable business? That's a good question. I think, uh, so you can do a lot from a distance. So there's a lot of people that I work with uh, on the coaching side that are virtual because they're in really expensive markets that will invest virtually. You just, you, I think you need one person on the ground there that can really be your, they, they got to be your salesperson. So going on the appointment. So we really only have one person in each of the other cities that we're not, like our hub is in Pensacola and most people live there. But really all those people could live anywhere except for the people that really need to go on the appointments and deal with the sellers. I have some people that negotiate and sell over the phone um, without seeing and then they're kind of their buyers turn into their contractors or people like that. So there's, there's a guy I know that virtually wholesales in all around the U.S. and he just buys stuff and sells it. Um, and he never goes look at it. So it's possible, but I would say you probably need that one person, that kind of acquisition or sales rep, and they gotta be, they got to be really good and trustworthy um, to make sure that, that it's right, but then you can also use your buyers from the wholesaling side to give you feedback on the house. Um, just, just make sure that you know, you're doing what you say you're going to do with the sellers. Like the, a lot of these sellers, we are, we're, their lives are changing by what we're telling them. So we, we don't want to you know, lie to them or tell them we're going to do something when we can't. We usually, it's very rare that we completely shut the door on these transactions. I mean, we tell them, like, we're not sure. If, if their number's off and we know it's not a great deal, we'll say, we, we can try it, but, you know, give us two weeks, we'll try it, but I'm, I'm not sure we can do anything. We, we're going to use our network and see if we can do something with this. It's not for us. If it's for us, I can shut the door. Like, if I know I'm going to flip it and the numbers work for me, I can just say, yeah, it's done, we'll, we'll buy it. And we're at that point now, but I wasn't at that point before. So you just have to be... You know, be careful because if it's an owner-occupant and they're like three days before closing is where you put your due diligence date, your inspection clause, and then you pull the contract three days before closing, their stuff's in boxes and their moving truck is coming. Like, it's a game changer for them. So just think about that. Think about all that stuff that you're doing. And that's why wholesalers get a bad rap a lot of times is, you know, they're just not doing business the way they should. And that's the biggest thing for me is make sure that we're we're doing right by the sellers because they're, they're really our business. You know, it's not the buyers. We're, we're managing the sellers. So. Okay. One, one, more. <laughs> one, yeah, one, one more. One more. One more. Yeah. What is your criteria to hire our, your boots on the ground? The guy that is knocking at the doors. What is the criteria for them? Yeah. I, I, I try not to have anybody that has a, I personally don't like people that have a real estate background. So I don't like, really like real estate agents. I don't like people that have to retrain to a new mentality because this stuff is, what we do is different than what a real, realtor does when they go to the, I have a real estate license in Florida. So it's a totally different mindset shift of what we're offering and the numbers that we're at. I mean, we typically have to buy like under 50% of the repaired value on these houses. So we're offering like less than 50 cents on the repaired dollar. So... Um, and they had to be good in, in sales and negotiation. I really like people who um, are used to doing in-home sales. So they could be um, like, 
I don't know, vacuum salespeople, uh, just not really cheesy vacuum salespeople. But uh, one of my best, uh, we have a, um, a uh, uh, she was a social worker. And I think that's really good. She's used to going into the kind of lower income areas and not really afraid of that and dealing with people that are on uh, lower income. So that's where a lot of our properties come from and people that we're dealing with. So somebody with really good social skills, like uh, you can do a personality test called the DISC test, D-I-S-C. Uh, TonyRobbins.com slash DISC is what we use. And it's really good. You can check personality profiles. Somebody with a really high eye, I like, that's really friendly and can, can talk, but not talk too much. You know, can also listen. So, um, yeah, just be, and people that have sales experience, I really think that it, sales is strong in, in that. I don't think real estate's as important. I can teach that to anybody, um, and the way we do business. So, clean slate there, and high sales experience is what I like. Um, another one is like our, I think she was like a shoe salesperson or something, like a podorthist, if anybody knows who that is, like insole sales, I think. So kind of weird. Now you can buy stuff for that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, man, I'm sure we've got a lot more questions, but why don't we give a nice uh, warm hand for Bill Allen. Amazing. <laughs> well, I the time. So good. Hey, thanks for learning with us today on the show. We would love to meet you at one of our free monthly meetups in Middle Tennessee. Hit the thumbs up button if you like the content. Make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss a thing on this channel. Check out another awesome investing video here.